Well, hello everyone and welcome to the Harmful Algal Bloom webinar series. Uh, my name is Amy Weckel and I'm from the Illinois Water Resources Center at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. I will be the moderator for today's session. This webinar is hosted by the Algal Bloom Action Team and I'm trying to move my slide forward. There we go. Um, of which the Illinois Water Resources Center is a member. The Algal Bloom Action Team is a collaboration of water professionals, researchers, and educators from 12 states in the North Central region of the United States. Team members include the National Network of Water Resources Research Institutes, the North Central Region Water Network, and university extensions within each state in the North Central region. In addition to hosting a webinar series, our team is developing a website of resources, including fact sheets and frequently asked questions on HABS topics. I encourage each of you to visit our website, which I'm putting in the chat right now, um, to explore some of the resources we have to date, including a What You Should Know fact sheet, a HABS Frequently Asked Questions database, and recordings from our virtual HABS Research Symposium, which was held in January. Before we get started, a few, oops, oh, oh, sorry, a few uh, housekeeping items. We will have a Q&A session after our speakers present today. Please list your questions for our speakers in the Q&A panel, and we will do our best to address all of them following the presentations. If you are having any technical issues or have any questions about the Algo Bloom Action Team, please list those in the chat as well. And we will be happy to assist you as best we can. Today's session, is the kickoff to the Algal Bloom Action Team's HAB webinar series, which will be held bi-monthly moving forward. Today's presentations focus on identifying and monitoring HABs, and we have two great speakers lined up for you. Our first speaker is Chris Jones, a research engineer at IIHR Hydroscience and Engineering at the University of Iowa. He manages the university's network of water quality sensors deployed across the state of Iowa. His research focuses on contaminant of hydrology of nutrients and sediment in agricultural landscapes and municipal drinking water. He holds a PhD in analytical chemistry from Montana State University and a BA in chemistry and biology from Simpson College in Indianola. Prior to working at UI, he held positions at Des Moines Waterworks and the Iowa Soybean Association. His presentation entitled Algae Blooms and Nutrification of Iowa Surface Waters, Patterns, Processes, and Opportunities will kick us off today. Chris, thanks for joining us and I'll stop sharing my screen now. And Chris, you can take it away. Okay, thanks, Amy. Um, and so, yes, my name's Chris Jones. I, I work at IIHR uh, Hydroscience and Engineering. Uh, they're uh, out of the Stanley Building on the banks of the Iowa River in Iowa City. Uh, the Institute is 100 years old uh, and has been uh, doing uh, work in hydraulics, uh, dam design and flooding. Uh, for most of that hundred years, but uh, just only recently uh, began work in, in water quality, which of course is a big issue here in Iowa. And so I, I've been here uh, at the Institute since 2015. And so <clears throat> I'm not an engineer, as, as Amy said, I'm an analytical chemist by training. And so engineers feel qualified to call themselves scientists all the time, but they don't let scientists call themselves engineers, and I'm kind of the exception to that. And so um, I have a website, and I post all my slides for my presentations, and so if you want my slides, you can go there and get them. I do not have these up there quite yet, but I will here probably before the end of the day. I also write blog posts about agriculture and water quality, and I invite you to check some of those out. And so, yes, we have a, a sensor network uh, throughout the state of Iowa that is measuring water quality continuously. Um, there's a, a shot of one of the sites, um, about 70 sites around Iowa, we're measuring a nitrate at, at all of them and then a subset of um, other parameters uh, at these other sites. And, um, <clears throat> 
this is a, a site on the Watsapinican River, and so the sensors uh, slide down through that PVC pipe. Uh, there you see on the left and up on the river bank, we have a uh, dry box with a solar panel and a deep cycle battery, a, a modem and a data blogger. And so we send data back to Iowa City in 15 minute packets. Um, and so we're accumulating an enormous amount of data and that uh, is posted to a website. And here's another a shot of a the inlet and the outlet of a crep wetland in northeast Iowa, where we're uh, measuring the wetlands capacity to sequester nutrients. And as I said, all this data goes up onto our website, the water quality information system. And so when you go to it, you'll see this map and you can click on one of those sites and see what the nitrate uh, concentration is in uh, right now, uh, along with a lot of other really interesting uh, water quality data and information. And so you can see there when you when you click on a site, it delineates the upstream area uh, from the site. And it'll give you the nitrate concentration and a bunch of other information if you're interested. There's an excellent land use tool on the um, website. And so you can click on any spot in the state of Iowa and it will delineate the upstream area from that spot and show you what the land cover is uh, in that watershed. And so this is the Iowa River watershed upstream of Iowa City. And you can see it's about 38% corn, 29% soybeans, and, and then those other land covers. And so um, I think everybody knows uh, here in Iowa, we have the problem with, with algae and we're a strong contributor to the Gulf of Mexico, a dead zone. And we have the drinking water issues here in Iowa with the Des Moines Water Works, um, uh, as does Toledo, uh, related to the algae and uh, excess nutrients in our streams. And so uh, this has been an issue for quite some time here, especially with Des Moines. Uh, Des Moines, we, ha we have a bad uh, nitrate issue in the municipal water supply. Uh, but we also have issues with, um, with the algae in both of the rivers. Um, the utility uses both the Raccoon and the Des Moines rivers uh, for a source. Um, that last slide was 2008 here. This was just this last summer, uh, a really severe cyanobacteria bloom in the Des Moines River. Um, and that <clears throat> sample there on the left in the in the plastic uh, container, that, that's Des Moines River water last summer. And that's what the citizens of Des Moines are, you know, that's where their drinking water is coming from. So this is a serious issue here. Um, we also have a number of constructed lakes uh, in Iowa, along with some glacial lakes um, that really suffer from uh, these blue-green algae blooms. Um, this is uh, here McBride Lake in 2019. This is a very popular uh, state park, kind of situated in between Cedar Rapids and Iowa City. Um, and so this has gotten a lot of media attention, um, but we really have a difficult time making progress, um, you know, in dealing with this problem because, you know, we don't deal with our nutrient issues. And so, um, you know, here in Iowa, I, we have about 70% of our lands in corn and soybean production. Uh, we have 25 million hogs, 4 million beef cattle, uh, 80 million laying chickens and so forth, as you can see there. But we've also, you know, don't have diverse farms anymore. And so uh, this on the right is a farm in northern Iowa in Winnebago County. Um, and you can see in 1941, we had a great diversity of land use on that farm. And now we, uh, you know, basically just have corn and soybeans uh, there in 1976 with a little bit of oats. And of course, the oats would be gone now. And so this land use is, is really driving the nutrification of our streams. And uh, as a consequence, we have you know, these terrible algae blooms here in our waters. And so <clears throat> even though our landscape looks really clean right now, you know, we have two species, uh, you know, GMO corn and soybeans that 
you know, we've eliminated all the weeds and, um, you know, the destination of that, that grain is, you know, either the hogs in the confinement there in the middle or the ethanol, uh, which is a big part of our a production system here, about 60% of our corn goes to, to make ethanol that now is being sold as a, you know, solution to climate change by the ag industry and, uh, but, you know, a big source of the pollution of our water. And so, you know, this is a leaky system and we really have a hard time keeping the the nutrients uh, on the landscape and getting them into the grain. And of course that gets into our, our streams. And so I thought I'd present a little data here for Iowa uh, that I've been working on uh, from the sensor network and from other sources. And so this is a map of Iowa and it, it shows uh, where the data is gonna come from that I'm gonna present. Uh, part of Iowa drains to the Missouri River there left of the, the purple line and then the rest to the upper Mississippi River. Um, and when we look at uh, last year, um, uh, nitrate loss to our streams, uh, nitrate nitrogen, our land draining to the upper Mississippi, we, we lost 435 million pounds of, of nitrogen to the the upper Mississippi, um, 191 million pounds to the Missouri River. And you can see there, that's about 27 pounds per crop acre uh, to the east and about 23 pounds per crop acre to the west, which, you know, is about 15% of the farmer's inputs, at least in terms of commercial nitrogen. Uh, when we look at these individual watersheds, uh, the black number is a loss per per total area uh, pounds per acre the the red number is a loss per crop acre and then the, the blue is the runoff from that watershed in in inches and you can see some things in this map here that are pretty remarkable um, again this is 2020 data up here in northeast iowa in the driftless area we really have some enormous losses of nitrogen uh, on a per crop acre basis. And so the Yellow River there, uh, 78 pounds per acre, um, you know, really astonishing. Uh, Northwest Iowa, we can see over here, the Floyd River, we have a real um, large intensity of, of hog production here, uh, 35, 36 pounds per crop acre uh, with only 10 inches of runoff. And so uh, we see these areas where we have disproportionately high uh, amounts of nitrate leaving the landscape. And when we look at this in the context of the, the larger basins, um, this is the area of land, uh, uh, area of Iowa land draining to the Missouri River. Uh, the red dotted line is our <clears throat> fraction of the watershed. We have 3.3% of the land in the Missouri basin. Iowa contributes about 12% of the water and about 55% of the nitrate. And so the Missouri River would have almost no nitrate in some years were it not for contributions from Iowa. Uh, going to the upper Mississippi, we have 21% of the land, 21% of the water and 45% of the nitrate. And then down at the Gulf, we have 4.5% of the land, 6% of the water and 29% of the nitrate. And so, you know, if we're gonna solve this issue, the, you know, the algae blooms in the Gulf and the dead zone and, and uh, these other sort of continental scale water quality problems, we're really gonna have to focus on places like Iowa. And so how much nitrogen leaves Iowa? Well, when we look at the five year running annual averages, here, which is what the Gulf Hypoxia Task Force is looking at. <clears throat> uh, right now, in an average year now, we're up to about 425 million tons uh, leaving, 4 425,000 tons leaving Iowa. Um, that's approximately doubled since 2003, uh, the five-year running annual average. And we see it's increasing much more rapidly in our areas draining to the Missouri there in green than it is uh, to areas draining to the upper Mississippi. 
Um, and I always say we have a mass balance here problem here. The wide bars are the uh, inputs. And so we have commercial nitrogen and the various animal manure, animal manures fixation by soybean. Uh, and the yellow, the yellow bar, the narrow bar is the uh, amount of nitrogen that's being removed in the grain. And so the red, red line there is the Okay, maybe one more because I didn't see that one. <laughs> there we go. Start there. Thank you. Okay, so this um, graph shows, you know, the, the mass balance problem we have with nitrogen in Iowa. Uh, the wide bars are the inputs. Uh, the narrow yellow bar is the amount of nitrogen harvested in the grain. And so you can see our inputs, you know, pretty substantially increase the amount leaving in the grain. And so uh, the red line there is the difference between the two, the surplus, about 32% of that surplus uh, makes it to our streams. And so we really go to great lengths to, to avoid talking about inputs because farmers are, you know, really, uh, you know, resistant to applying less um, amounts of nitrogen fertilizer. And so as a consequence, we've been focusing on these edge of field treatments like wetlands and things like cover crops. And, you know, I maintain we're not going to solve this until we address this mass balance problem we have with nitrogen. Uh, phosphorus, it's not quite as bad. Um, we recently published a paper on phosphorus loss uh, you can see the trend down there in the lower right. Um, we're probably not getting a lot worse, but we're, you know, not getting a lot better either. Um, and so, you know, we hear a lot of discussion these days about soil health and how, um, you know, we'd like to uh, incentivize, financially incentivize farmers to adopt soil health uh, practices in the hopes that this will help solve some of our nutrient issues. Um, and I would maintain that, you know, that's not going to do it. We're trying to squeeze as much as we can out of this, you know, agroecosystem here. And when we look since 1999, we've, we've increased the amount of nitrogen leaving in the grain by 27%, but we've increased our total inputs 36%. To, to get that 27% in the grain, and we've increased the amount in our river eight by, in our rivers by 83%. And so, you know, this is what we would expect. Uh, we're trying to squeeze every little bit out of this ecosystem, and that's going to have a, you know, a disproportionately bad environmental response as we continue to do that. And so, um, I, and my presentations with this map, you know, what I did was I looked at the livestock populations in all of our Huck 8 watersheds in Iowa and then converted it to a human equivalent in terms of the nutrients and solids in that waste. And so this is the effective human population we have living in Iowa. And so can we um, achieve our water quality objectives? Can we... Um, you know, reduce the likelihood of these algae blooms in our waters and, and reduce the size of the dead zone as long as we continue this intensity of production. And I would maintain that we cannot. Um, you know, we do not have enough uh, tax dollars available. Um, we can't get farmers to adopt the way they need to adopt to solve this problem um, with these traditional approaches. And so that's my last slide. I, I'm sorry about the technical difficulty there that we had. Um, and I'll hand it back to you, Amy. Thank you, Chris. That was great. Um, and no worries on the technical difficulties. It's just a thing we deal with these days, right? <laughs> um, OK, so I'm going to share my screen again real quick. Okay, so again, any questions that you have for Chris, go ahead and put them in the Q&A panel and we will get to them in the Q&A session following 
Greg's uh, presentation. And so Greg is our second speaker today. He's an associate professor in the Department of Earth Sciences at the Indiana University, Purdue University. And he has quite a bio, bio here that you can read over. It's quite a mouthful. Um, and rather than embarrass myself by stumbling over it, uh, you can just peruse it at your leisure. Um, his presentation entitled Unraveling Drivers of Taste and Odor Occurrences in Eagle Creek Reservoir with Coupled Chemical, Physical, Biological Data will be our final presentation today. Thanks for joining us, Greg. And don't, yeah, don't forget to put your questions in the Q&A panel. I will stop sharing again. And Greg, it's all yours. Great, right. you see that all right? Yes, looks good, okay. thank you. Great, thank you so much for the uh, invitation to come and uh, uh, chat with you virtually today. Um, I've been working on algal bloom problems for about the last 15 years, uh, partly in Lake Champlain and partly what I'm gonna talk to uh, today about you, which is uh, the local reservoir in Indianapolis, uh, which is a, a major supplier for uh, drinking water in our system. Um, it, this is a reservoir that was, that was built in 1967. It supplies up to 80% of the city's drinking water. Um, relatively large. Uh, uh, it goes from kind of a deep part of about 13 meters to a shallow part at the northern part of the uh, of the inlet. So the reservoir, of course, is in, right outside of Indianapolis and in Indiana. Uh, this is a depiction of the watershed. Basically, it is uh, something that is rapidly urbanizing uh, as a part of the growth of the northern suburbs of the city of Indianapolis. Um, dam is down here. Uh, and then this is the reservoir that we've been uh, working with. I'm going to present the results of two um, kind of major efforts. Uh, the first was uh, the work of a PhD student, uh, Nico Clarison. The second was uh, a combination of, of students looking at some things. Uh, we had a couple of different focuses. Uh, one was to look at sort of how uh, depth uh, is part of this and in much more detail about some of the microbiology that's going on in the lake uh, that, that uh, generates some of the secondary metabolites that we're interested in, namely taste and odor compounds. Uh, so while these are uh, uh, secondary metabolites of a range of species, including cyanobacteria, uh, they are not generally thought of to be a, a toxic at all but they do have significant uh, negative uh, impacts on water quality in terms of, uh, of an off flavor, uh, as well as sort of a smell that permeates because they have a very low odor threshold. This represents then a substantial cost to remove these because they're pretty recalcitrant compounds uh, and require additional treatment for that. Geosmin uh, and methyl isoborneol are sort of the two main culprits of the suite of uh, small volatile organic molecules that we uh, investigate and think about with respect to taste and odor compounds. Um, and in this reservoir, they've been sporadic uh, problems uh, throughout uh, the last well, really about 20 years, uh, occurring mostly sort of late April through early June, really focused uh, around and, and centered around May in terms of the, an early season uh, problem associated with this. So I'm going to kind of talk a little bit about some of the things that we have done to try and focus on who are the major players here in terms of the microbiology, uh, and then how is that linked to some of the chemical uh, and physical characteristics, particularly in terms of the hydrologic system, as well as some of the, uh, the weather parameters associated uh, with the, the, uh, the reservoir. When we look at that historical data, the geosmin and the are sporadic, but they often don't co-occur. Sometimes they do. And uh, a lot of data had been collected through time looking at sort of traditional microscopy techniques for looking at um, morphologically distinct cyanobacterial cell counts, and those just weren't correlating very well. Um, so uh, the first thing that we kind of looked at was a, a genetic uh, a look at what, what was going on here. So we were able to collect um, 46 samples for a metagenomic analysis and several hundred samples for looking at 16S bacterial community compositions. And what we found, of course, was sort of an interesting spread uh, top to bottom across uh, depth in terms of the cyanobacteria and some other species that were in there. Uh, but what was interesting is that uh, we found that while the cyanobacteria are an important player in this, they are much more specifically linked to geosmin concentrations, whereas a, a lower abundance 
uh, suite of organisms in the actinomycetes uh, uh, group were linked to the methyl isoborneal concentrations. When we take a deeper dive into the metagenomics, we were able to take a look at some of the pathways associated with the uh, biological production of both geosmin and methyl isoborneal. I won't deal you bore you with some of the details here, but basically we were able to take a look at the genetic, genetic information and look at kind of where we had more reads associated with those things across depth uh, and across uh, uh, sort of some different uh, um, species. So up here, a couple of heat maps. And the way that we read these are that these four are in this, are in this, are in the cyanobacterial domain. These three are in the actinobacterial domain. And here we have some different times and depths associated with the, uh, the year of data that we have the metagenomic information in. What we found is that both geosmin and methyl isoborneal synthases were present basically at the times when we had the highest concentrations of MIB and geosmin. That was good. Um, and then it was somewhat distributed between uh, both of these uh, groups of organisms. Um, but that more of it basically was present on sort of a count basis associated with the actinobacteria. And so we've published a good bit of this data in a 2019 paper in Water Resources Research uh, based on Nico's work. Um, and so these, uh, these samplings that, are, that uh, were performed um, across several depths of the 2013 season gave us this measurement and the link that the actinomycetes were linked to the MIB, the cyanobacteria were, were linked to the geosmin. Another way to look at this data was to sort of integrate depth against time for the deep site that we worked on, where we can see the geosmin and the MIB concentrations in terms of this heat map, again, with the x-axis through time. And we can look at some of the um, cyanobacterial and actinobacterial species uh, that are associated with some of this. What we'll see also is that this dotted line is a copper-based uh, algicide treatment. So one of the ways that the uh, taste odor compound problem in this reservoir is dealt with by the water company is to put in a copper-based algicide. Um, so what you can see here is that the geosmin is knocked off pretty rapidly, uh, but the MIB uh, actually persists for a while, uh, as well as kind of uh, has some other characteristics associated with how it's distributed in depth. Um, and then some of these other organisms in terms of what, uh, how they're linked to some of this is also quite interesting uh, against this. What that kind of showed us is what the algicide treatment was highly effective against the cyanobacteria and almost immediately uh, ceased geosmin uh, production. The actinobacteria were largely unaffected by the algicide. Uh, the MIB was not immediately impacted, but anytime I think you uh, add algicide and so severely disrupt the ecology of the system, uh, that also had an effect on uh, the actinobacteria and was tended to be reasonably affected, but effective rather, but uh, trailed longer in time in terms of how that worked. Overall, these taste and odor producers preferred, preferred cold, well mixed, uh, very turbid, nutrient rich conditions. So that kind of uh, wrapped up that part of it and gave us an interesting uh, bit of information that was important in terms of you know, who was basically responsible essentially for these taste and odor compound. Um, secondary metabolites and their production in this reservoir. We built on that by then taking a look at the metagenomic data and utilizing that to help design a series of uh, primers that were specific to the synthases for both geosmin and methyl isoborneal. We're certainly not the only ones to do that. There's a recent paper actually that, that referenced uh, some of our work as well on a suite of these um, primers that are effective for looking at uh, some of these specific things. What we found and what that paper also was, was uh, consistent with was that uh, they're generally a little bit specific in terms of their application to, for two particular systems. Uh, part of that has to do with the, the uh, sort of metabolic plasticity associated with these uh, uh, biological pathways for their formation and for the synthases themselves. And for some of the differences, of course, in the organisms that are able to uh, produce these compounds. But we were able to come up with a couple of uh, primers that worked really quite well uh, for looking at this at Eagle Creek. So we took that um, and uh, basically established sort of a, 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 a more spatially resolved and temporally uh, uh, detailed analysis. And so we took 
uh, a bunch of sites, uh, 12 just in the northern part. The uh, entryway for the sort of the, uh, the inflow of the Eagle Creek uh, um, waterway is right up here. So the, the general direction of flow is going to be north to south. Uh, and we also note that some of the uh, uh, taste and odor compound concentrations and things like that were generally higher kind of in this area. So we're, we targeted this area to try and look at kind of the spatial and temporal uh, evolution, if you would, of both the uh, organisms that can produce this, um, towards the concentration of these metabolites, as well as a suite of other other analyses to try and pin down um, how that system behaves. Uh, we combine this with some stuff I'm not going to show today in terms of remote sensing. So both um, sort of shipboard as well as things that are up in the air. Uh, we utilize a drone to do a bunch of imaging with this as well as space-based uh, multispectral analyses. Um, combine that with uh, some, some uh, weather data uh, and uh, hydrologic data. We're fortunate that the Eagle Creek um, system has a super gauge. Uh, just upstream. So really good data from that as well. So in 2018, what we saw was that there were significant Methylisoborneol uh, events, again, sort of centered around May. Uh, there were a couple of algicide uh, applications to help knock that down. Geosmin was relatively low in that year, but present. Um, and so what we had basically was a, a database that included a bunch of stuff. Um, you know, we had 43 different metrics uh, across uh, things from the watershed, uh, weather system, our genetic analysis in terms of uh, looking at the synthases as well as total cells, remote sensing information, micro micro microscopy cell counts, uh, a host of water chemistry uh, parameters, as well as, of course, the taste and odor compounds themselves, uh, to try and understand a little bit more, again, about how the system behaves over time and space. And so you know, what we come up with are a bunch of these kinds of plots where we're kind of looking at uh, for example, SRP on this side, uh, MIB or methyl isoborneal on this side, and kind of how, as a heat map, they kind of go across that. We can also kind of take a look at this as a, as a movie, so this is kind of looping through in time, right? And so what we were hoping to catch with this was if we could see sort of an evolutionary progression, um, not in terms of the evolution of the organisms, but in terms of how the spread of things spatially kind of developed um, across time. So in other words, would we expect to see a hotspot that's going to grow out from there? Um, so now looking, of course, at all of these maps for 45 different parameters all at once over time is not really possible. So uh, what do we do to try and get at some of that is to, is to take this data and take a look at this in some different ways. And that's part of what I also wanted to show you uh, today in terms of some of the ways that we've been utilizing to try and um, look at the combinations between physical, chemical, and biological properties, and really look at this in terms of, you know, what's driving uh, secondary metabolite production. Uh, in this case, we're looking, of course, at the taste and odor compound, but similar things can be looked at in terms of, uh, of some of the neurotoxins. I've done a lot of work up in Lake Champlain, particularly on microcystin. Uh, some of the same stuff can be applied for this. So we look at simple correlation. Um, you know, there are some things to, to get out of this, um, but we quickly hit some limitations in terms of what all of this means. And so we moved into principal component analysis. Um, and again, we had a nice database for this in terms of 335 sample across 45 metrics. Um, and we come up with this by plot. I don't know how many of you know how to read these, but uh, I'm hoping a lot of you do. Um, and so what did, this, what did this kind of tell us? Well, one, it told us that the qPCR primers, particularly for methyl isoborneal, work pretty well um, in terms of being able to describe um, how that's linked to uh, methyl isoborneal production. Uh, but it also showed us that a lot of the, the variability in the system was really linked, linked to discharge of nutrient load associated with the watershed and then mixing and stratification within the, uh, within the reservoir itself. We sort of progressed from that into uh, non-metric multidimensional or, uh, scaling, NMDS. And uh, again, we have a biplot there, which allows us to separate out and sort of look at some of the uh, covariance associated with some of these different parameters. But what I want to draw attention to is this sort of thing, where we're able to map these uh, and in this MDS space. And so what I have here is sort of a color-coded uh, kind of... Uh, shaded area that represents how the system's behaving at different months. And so we start here in April, progress to May, June, July, August, September, and then back to October. 
The ribbon is associated with the MIB concentration. So what we see is that we start um, initially in April, it gets high pretty fast, uh, gets high through here in May, uh, tapers off uh, a bit through uh, June into July, and then we get uh, much, much lower um, to, to negligible values for this. And then interestingly, we come back uh, to this space very close to the beginning of this. So this is sort of represents a hysteresis in the system associated with how uh, the major parameters are working. Um, which is interesting because if we get back to this, it suggests, you know, how do we go from here to here? So there's something else that we're missing so far in terms of uh, how to kind of get across that, uh, that stable state, if you would, and kick this off. So that's something that we're working on. But I find it really interesting that we had this hysteresis pattern in terms of how things work. It's, a, it's sort of shockingly similar to some work we've done in Lake Champlain. So we think that this kind of behavior um, is something that maybe is consistent with a lot of sort of northern uh, latitude, relatively shallow freshwater systems that are eutrophic in terms of how uh, algal blooms associated with different species kind of track through time and how there may be uh, sort of a complicated uh, network of reactions between what's going on uh, with the watershed, with the weather system, with uh, the reservoir itself in terms of internal external loading and all of the factors that impact uh, the microbial cells in the system. Lastly, we utilized a boosted regression tree model. Uh, so this is a machine learning technique sort of based on a, a bootstrapping analysis. Um, and and it's, it's interesting because that focuses on one parameter. In this case, we look at methyl isoporneal as our response parameter. And we're able to model these things. What this gave us that was additional for this was that uh, while we looked at a lot of associations with nutrients, phosphorus and nitrogen in particular, um, in this model, it really suggested that nitrate that was measured within the watershed was really the most important predictor for MIB, but only after it hit a certain threshold level, right? And so phosphorus wasn't limiting, nitrogen hits a certain threshold level, and that is when we saw the most significant responses really by far uh, in terms of that uh, system's response towards uh, methyl isoporneal production in that system. Uh, we also looked, did some lag analysis. We're looking at some of the things with the, uh, the watershed. Uh, so again, in this, in this system, highly variable in terms of the residence times uh, associated basically with some of the different uh, uh, seasons that we have here. Um, and noting that the reservoir nutrient conditions were significantly linked to that. Um, and what we think this uh, sort of means is that a large nutrient pulse of April or late March um, can then drive sort of that uh, taste and odor um, peak in May. So a, a really significant kind of lag between uh, watershed nutrient distribute, uh, I'm sorry, watershed nutrient input uh, and the uh, sort of uh, secondary metabolite biological response in the system. So to summarize this, uh, sort of utilizing this high resolution microbial uh, largely genetically based information with a, a significant suite of physical and chemical data uh, allows us to sort of refine what we understand about the bloom ecology um, and the gene expression associated with regulating this secondary metabolite production. Suggests that a relatively small number of organisms, principally in the actinobacteria, control taste and odor. Whereas things like chlorophyll A, phycocyanin, uh, general cell counts of chlorophytes, diatoms, et cetera, are not as well correlated. Uh, and that qPCR is actually a much better tool to characterize uh, and look at taste and odor production in that system. And that elevated uh, MIB levels appear to be responsible by these organisms to changes in nutrient availability, availability, particularly a shift in that nitrogen across the threshold when there's excess phosphorus present. Um, and then kind of finally, in terms of trying to wrap up the spatial variability of this, when we added sort of spatial variability into some of our models, that was have to be insignificant. And so basically, the way that we sampled it at least, and this is sort of a, a bi-weekly kind of look at this, um, is that the temporal variability really outweighs the spatial variability associated with that. So we did not capture that even by going out twice a week to do all this sampling over the, the entire season to, uh, to get into that. That's all I've got for a uh, presentation. I'd be happy to take questions. Well, thank you, Greg. Um, that is great.
another great presentation. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for participating in the Algo Bloom Action Team's kickoff webinar, and a special thanks to our presenters, of course, Chris and Greg, for their willingness to be the guinea pigs as we worked out the kinks in this uh, first session. Um, as a reminder, the webinar series will be held bi-monthly with the next webinar scheduled in May. Um, again, I've dropped our, or I'm going to drop our um, website in the chat. There we go. So that you can connect with the team and subscribe to our events. Um, prior to our next session, uh, you should receive an email with a link to today's recorded webinar along with a feedback survey. And we'd appreciate any comments or additional feedback you have on this series. Um, we'll now move into the Q&A uh, portion of the session and we'll draw initial questions and comments from those submitted in the chat box during the presentations. And we'll do our best to get to all of them. It looks like uh, Chris started answering some of them. And so if we have time, we'll go back over what he's listed as answers there. But let's start with the open questions first. Um, so we have some, uh, the first one is, any chance of collaboration with any African institutions on harmful algal blooms? Chris or Greg, do you have any knowledge of any African institutions that are working on this? I'm sorry, I don't. Uh, that's an interesting question. I don't directly uh, work with any African institutions on this, um, though I do know that there are, of course, like some Africa that uh, have some issues there. Um, we do some work with uh, some African institutions more on some of the metal contaminants and things like that, but that's quite different. Um, so. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Let's see, the next one. Do you recall Illinois nitrogen contribution to Mississippi? I, I think that's Mississippi. I think Greg McIsaac posted that in the question as maybe 400 million pounds. Okay. Oh, yes. I see that. 400 to 450 million pounds per year. Okay. Mm -hmm. Why can't proven natural nutrient recycling using soil microbiology be promoted more by the federal and state governments? Well, um, you know, so my, uh, people need to understand everything that farmers do in the Corn Belt it connects back to the Farm Bill, to the federal Farm Bill. And so we have cost share programs traditionally uh, that provide, you know, some portion of the money uh, for the farmer to conduct a practice and on built practices, these have engineering designs and um, all these other sorts of things. And so if we're going to promote these things like soil health and, um, you know, as you say, nutrient cycling and these sorts of things, if they're going to get public money, it's going to have to be measurable and verifiable. And so that becomes difficult when we, we talk about uh, these other approaches. Um, and the other thing is, you know, let's say soil health, for example, one approach would be to go to no-till, right? Uh, and so if we pay a farmer to, to do no-till for five years, and then in the sixth year, he needs to, he decides he's gonna till, um, you know, how do we, how do we account for that, you know, uh, and so it's difficult to uh, financially incentivize some of these practices the way we have uh, incentivized other practices in the past. Yeah, no, I, I've uh, done more work of that up in Vermont where we've had a, a sort of a, a long project looking at that, and that's always been a curious thing in terms of um, the watershed I've worked up in Vermont is, is actually two thirds in Canada. Uh, and the Canadians have a very different response in terms of their regulatory efforts to stem this. And so that's become an interesting place to sort of look at where some of the differences associated with particular regulatory frameworks uh, kind of has an effect, if that's kind of what the question is. Um, and so they've, they've done a lot more with respect to uh, uh, limiting tile drainage, for example. Uh, and some of the fields and things like that. Um, 
as a regulatory response where in Vermont, it was more sort of a, a program to educate and work with farmers uh, to try and make that more uh, of an education kind of piece as well as to try and, and help with funding on that. But uh, that always ends up being the, the problem, right? Is having enough money to sort of make that happen and make it so that we don't bankrupt the farmers to, to be doing this. Um, and you know the, the data so far in Lake Champlain is not entirely conclusive on which, which approach is better. I think it just takes a while to figure out. Um, but those are some of the issues I know that that uh, that we've had up there. Great, thank you both. That was great feedback. Um, another question that we have is: What strains of cyanobacteria co-occur during a hab? and what types of cyanotoxin usually are found in HABs occurrences? So, yeah, that's a great question. And so there, there are sort of a, there's a suite of, of, of cyanobacteria, of course, that do, do produce neurotoxins. Uh, and so, you know, things like uh, microcystis that make microcystin, uh, there's a phanazomena, and there's, you know, there's, a, there's a, uh, sorry, I'm not remembering them all off the top of my head. Those are some of the ones that we've worked with in particular. Um, and so what types of cyanotoxins usually are found in HAP occurrences? I mean, we, we look at several different, uh, different ones. I don't know that I'd want to say that anything's usual because every system is a little bit different. Uh, I focus more on trying to look at the genetic aptitude of the organisms in terms of what they can produce. But it's actually a bigger question uh, and a tougher one to solve in terms of really looking at the omics of it, uh, in terms of what are the conditions that will upregulate those genes for what they do produce. Uh, and why, and so that's a that's a tough question to answer on a, on a sort of a general thing, but I think it illustrates some of the the sort of challenge and maybe some of the advantage uh, and opportunities in terms of how we can apply uh, sort of coupled um, omics approaches with some of the uh, uh, the chemistry and uh, looking at the hydrology of the systems. Thank you. Chris, did you have anything to add to that? No, I, I really don't. Okay. Um, the next question is for either of you. Um, Chuck Tack lives on a lake in North Central Wisconsin, and he notices that he can see algae striations in the water as summer goes on. His question is, how does rainfall affect these striations? Does short, light rain trigger an algae bloom more often than a longer duration all-day rain? Um, and he's looking at late summer, August, hot, sunny, and low wind wave conditions. I'm happy to tackle that. I mean, we've, certainly we've seen um, and worked with a lot of these systems where you'll get um, kind, of, kind of near the surface of the lake, what looked like so these long threads. And those are, those, are, those are basically sort of the cyanobacteria starting to you know, sort of make larger community structures. Uh, sometimes they're threaded. I've seen them as big boluses. Um, and there's lots of, of uh, sort of interesting ideas as to why they do that. But if you're asking about kind of what, uh, in terms of rainfall, does this do? Um, and so largely my experience with these things is that when you see them near the surface, that's sort of something that happens to them when they're competing uh, for light, for nutrients and things like that near the surface. And so they'll tend to kind of get towards the surface. I mean, eventually you can get to where it's just like that. It's like a layer of paint uh, on the surface. That's that's as bad as I've seen it. Very bad. Um, and what's interesting is that actually is bad for the organisms uh, when they're competing like that because the UV stress associated with them being right at the surface is actually not good for them at all. Um, but the rain itself, in terms of how that works, um, you know, a rainstorm is going to kick up. Uh, more perturbation at the surface, and that's going to cause more mixing. That can break that up a little bit, but it doesn't necessarily um, sort of destroy the uh, the organisms. Or, um, I wouldn't say it necessarily sort of causes that. Um, when we think about uh, blooms like this, we're going to think about um, them coming uh, into, if you would, some uh, something that they're they're missing, right? Uh, so the limiting nutrient that they were previously missing, like phosphorus or or nitrogen. In, in many of these freshwater systems, at least. And so where is that coming from? Is that coming from a, a pulse from the watershed, which could be associated with a, a storm event? 
right, in terms of what's going on in the fields and things like that, and how that, that mixes nutrient in. The other source of that can just be the sediment that's already in the lake itself. So we've done a lot of work on what we call internal uh, loading. And that's associated with what's going on chemically in the water column, which the microbes also have a dramatic impact on. Uh, and if that system can get essentially reducing at the set at, at the sediment water interface, then that can actually pump quite a bit of phosphorus up into the system. So that is also linked uh, to what's going on with weather associated uh, with a lot of these algal blooms, particularly in shallow freshwater systems. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily blame like a little bit of rain on that. It's a little more complex in terms of what's going on with the nutrients in the system. How are those being transported? How are those being cycled? Uh, I hope that helps to answer the question. Yes, and to add to that, Gina um, posted in response to that same question um, that you are probably seeing blooms pop up during calm periods that follow storms. Heavy storms can bring in more nutrients via runoff, but if your lake is already nutrient rich, calm weather will affect scum formation the most. And you can reach out to Gina at dnrhabs at wisconsin.gov for more information. Thank you, Gina. Um, okay, the next question, how well did the remote sensing data correlate? Good, good question. Um, we're really working on that right now. So I, I wish I, part of the reason I'm not, I'm not presenting on it is because we're still working on it. In part, I think, you know, when I first started this, this project, we got funded to do this from the water company. I didn't realize how hard it would be to stitch together photos of water, which I probably should have done. Um, and so that's actually been really challenging is to sort of work with that spatial information and try to put that together. Um, and so, uh, I mean, I can show you really cool pictures associated with uh, multispectral information on these things where we can image some of that stuff. Um, I would say for our system, because uh, for the taste and odor compounds, we are not looking at systems that have tons and tons of organisms. These aren't actually associated with huge blooms, all right? The actinobacteria can do this when they're not in sort of a bloom state, when they're not seeing like, you know, really heavy concentrations, particularly near the surface. Um, and so for, for that problem, the uh, remote sensing hasn't worked as well. However, space bay remote sensing um, has been really useful for uh, some of the stuff that you can see, for example, on the western basin of Lake Erie. That's provided some really beautiful data associated with that that I've seen some different from, from some different groups uh, to really look at that sort of spatial and temporal uh, kind of component of this. We've tried to kind of play around with using a drone sort of in a more, more controlled system um, and how we'll do that. Um, and I think that'll pair well with some of the space-based stuff, in particular because the drone data actually is better when it's a little bit cloudy. Um, the, the sun glare actually is a, is a hard thing for us to filter out. Of course, you can't get space-based remote sensing data when it's cloudy. Um, not very good anyway. Um, not these way, right? And uh, so still working on that. Please uh, stay tuned in. But uh, that that's, that's, can be very useful in some systems. Uh, but for we looked at the taste and odor piece, it was uh, yeah, honestly a little disappointing. Great, thank you. Um, do you think that qPCR for taste and odor genes is better than GCMS detection? Um, so that's an interesting question. So I guess uh, not entirely sure uh, about the question. So GCMS detection is is how we do the the MIB and the geosmin. Um, analysis, um, the qPCR is looking at the genes. And it's, it, 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 it's important, I think, because that's fundamentally different. So the genes tell us, are the organisms there that can produce geosmin and MIB? It doesn't necessarily tell us that they are, right? The presence of the gene doesn't really tell us that they, that is what they are doing. That's more when we talk about omics, you want to get into transcriptomics or proteomic kind of components to that. Um, but if we're just thinking about, you know, can I use qPCR instead of um, that stuff? I mean, the, the, there is quite a bit in terms of the data set that we have that suggests that that is something that co-varies significantly. Therefore, you could potentially use that. But um, I'm a little trepidatious to do that because of that difference in terms of what uh, the genetics means uh, with respect to whether it is producing that or not. I see. So 
that the GCMS would kind of measure functional capabilities? Well, I mean, so you can look at, so again, so GCMS as a, as a, as a tool, right? That's the instrument that we use to measure the actual molecules, the geosmin and methyl isoborneal molecules. Now you can use GCMS to look at, of course, other things. So I'm not sure if the question is about what part of that is. There's a clarification of the question there. Happy to right. clarify. Hopefully. Okay. Uh, yeah, Hunter, if you want to put in a little bit more information, we can um, maybe get to that. We have just a few more minutes. Um, says, neither talk seemed to mention phosphorus or the use of phycocyanin level monitoring, as might be done with YSI Sondes. I don't know that word. Yeah, no, we use, uh, we use YSI Sondes, certainly, and uh, we, part of our database <laughs> does, does look at uh, phycocyanin levels. We measure those for our data. Um, and so and we do measure uh, phosphorus, both as solubly reactive phosphorus uh, and as uh, total dissolved and total phosphorus overall. Uh, and so, yes, uh, certainly phosphorus is important at Eagle Creek. What was interesting about the data that we looked at with the modeling, particularly the loose regression tree stuff, was that the tr we're you know, trying to find kind of a trigger for you know, sort of what's to basically turning on uh, the secondary metabolite production it wasn't the phosphorus, it was this threshold nitrogen level. So, so certainly not, not meaning to indicate that phosphorus is not important, I think it is. Um, but what was uh, actually a bit of a surprise for me was uh, our results sort of uh, suggesting in a couple of different ways that uh, nitrogen actually is, is critically important. Uh, we need to follow that up and think in more detail on the exact speciation of the nitrogen, but because uh, uh, we've looked at it with nitrate and ammonia, but of course there's more to it. <clears throat> Okay, one more. It seems like Chris is answering all of his questions um, all by himself. So thank you, Chris. Um, one more for Greg. In Eagle Creek, how are you able to distinguish between a temperature and nitrate threshold? Yeah, that's, a, that's a great question as well. Um, and what's interesting is that for the taste and odor compounds, there is a, there, the, those, those two things are both very important. So we see these taste and odor compounds uh, in sort of colder waters, uh, more mixed earlier in the season. Uh, later season, actually, we get more uh, algal blooms, fortunately, not ones that are producing a lot of neurotoxins or taste and odor compounds. Of course, we're always worried about, you know, what, how much of a, of a tipping point could, could shift that. Thankfully, we haven't seen that yet, but uh, uh, certainly temperature is an important part of some of what we see in terms of the, uh, the community ecology associated with these organisms, uh, as is the phosphorus and nitrogen. Okay, and I think we have time for one more question um, before we're out of time. Um, was sampling always performed at the same depth or various depths? At various depths, how did you account for this in your analysis and graphs? Yes, yeah, so we had one study where we looked at a, at a range of depths. So we sort of looked at uh, that depth for uh, the more recent study where we uh, where I presented all the modeling stuff. We stuck to the surface because the part of that was really trying to look at what we could also pick up from the remote sensing piece of it. Um, so when we looked at that with depth, uh, we were partly trying to look at uh, aspects associated with, uh, with sort of that lateral mobility of the, uh, sort of with the vertical mobility of the organisms, because uh, we know that some of them have the ability uh, to regulate buoyancy. Um, couple that with what's going on at the sediment water interface in terms of internal phosphorus loading. So that's part of what we were trying to look at with that, um, if that sort of answers the question quickly. All right, well, it's three o'clock exactly, so I completely understand if you need to leave. Anne, is it okay if they stay on for a bit longer, if they're available, and, and maybe answer a few more questions? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so. uh, what's that, Greg? So I'm happy to do so. Okay, great. Um, okay, the next question, while the focus certainly needs to be maintained on the food source for cyanobacteria and other algal blooms, I would like to know how much of the study and science is being applied to the mitigation of deposited food source. In short, can we apply this science to the testing, removal techniques, and disposal of algal blooms in a safe and effective manner, which will help remove the cyclical absorption and reintroduction of deposited phosphorus and nitrogens of the still water zones? 
this uh, Patrick, he designed and built and operated a machine that removed algal blooms, but they were forced to abandon the efforts due to disposal problems of toxic waste. That's a great question. It's fascinating. Okay. Um, so uh, I guess when we're talking about food sources, I, mean, I think we're talking about sort of carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, uh, things that can be limiting in some of those products. Um, and so if we talk also about uh, sickle absor absorption and reintroduction of the phosphorus and rice the still water zones, I'm assuming we're talking here about internal loading processes and the just and sort of the mobility of these things between the sediment and the water. Uh, I don't know, Patrick, you can uh, type something to let us know that so that's the question. But um, I, I guess to sort of answer that, um, yeah, no, we've uh, looked a lot at kind of uh, how that mobility uh, works between those things, um, in part to sort of better understand how organisms are um, able to take advantage of and even uh, to uh, exacerbate the problem, if you would. So we know that underneath algal blooms, uh, even though these are cyanobacteria organisms that produce oxygen, they can also consume oxygen and they actually make the water underneath them more reducing under blue conditions. Uh, that tends to then accelerate the rate in which nutrients are released from the sediment because a lot of them are stuck to iron oxide hydroxide minerals. Uh, those become reductively dissolved and you get a significant flux of phosphorus. We've got a couple of papers on that uh, uh, for Lake Champlain. But um, and then the other part of that, of course, that's important is if we're looking at, uh, and I'm not sure this is kind of the direction that the uh, questioner was thinking about, but if we kind of think about the mechanisms by which these different forms of nitrogen and phosphorus and even carbon are mobile uh, in terms of trying to look at those in terms of recycling or in terms of uh, collecting this as a waste product, uh, that's, uh, that, that's, that's also sort of all part of um, importance of, the, of doing kind of that basic science to inform those kinds of things. Yeah, I'm not sure I've answered the question. Okay, yeah, Patrick, if you have a follow-up to that and you're still on the line, go ahead and throw it in the Q&A. Um, okay, this is a good one. This comes up a lot. If copper is used as, a, as an algae side and kills cyanobacteria, which are gram-negative bacteria, LPS endotoxin will be released. LPS, even at very small concentrations, can stimulate the immune system. I wonder whether endotoxin is measured. So if we're asking about Eagle Creek, I don't think we're measured. So the, the Citizens measures a series of uh, neurotoxins. I don't know that they, they, they measure uh, LPS endotoxins as, as part of that or not. I don't know off the top of my head, I have to look. I know they measure some other things like microcystin, but uh, endotoxin, I'm not sure of. It's an interesting point in terms of the algae side because a lot of these things, the neurotoxins, these other compounds, these are things that are produced intracellularly. And sort of the rate at which those are released uh, can be an important part of that. It's always a, an interesting thing when you add an algae side. And we've seen this uh, in Eagle Creek right after the algae side implication. There's a spike uh, in the release of these secondary metabolites. A little bit for taste and odor, but the same thing should be true for, for these uh, neurotoxins endotoxins, anything that's going to be, that's going to have a higher concentration sort of intracellularly, that uh, putting in something that'll cause lysis of the organism will create basically a spike of that. Um, we've actually also followed that up and we just submitted the paper um, looking at some of the other organisms and their response to ones that can basically um, consume some of these things. So we look at both uh, uh, metabolite uh, formation and um, uh, different strategies for, for metabolizing or co-metabolizing. Uh, some of those uh, some of those molecules. Okay, and one more in the Q and A, and then I'll check back in with the chat and see if we've left any unanswered. But do actinobacterial species and freshwater produce toxins similar to cyanobacteria, as well as taste and odor compounds? That's a good question. Um, and that I don't know off the top of my head. I should know that, but I, I, I don't want to. I don't want to answer something I'm not sure about. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, 
that's fine. Um, Patrick says, yes, you captured what he was getting at. The algae absorb and absorb absorb and adsorb <laughs> these nutrients and when they become surface rotting bga removing them stops the re reintroduction of the dead algae and its foods okay and then to follow up on patrick's question if you can harvest this algae scum from a lake what can you do with it can it be put on a field is it hazardous waste Well, that's an interesting question. I mean, we, uh, it, it, in my understanding of that, it sort of depends on state to state guidelines in terms of what we can, we, can, we sort of consider to be levels that are actionable uh, in terms of those things. Many states don't regulate that stuff at all. Um, so I don't, I don't think it would be considered hazardous waste, at least in some places. Um, then what do you do with it? I mean, that's a, that's a fascinating question. Um, you know, my hope is that someday we can recycle stuff like this and, and turn that back into um, things that will be usable in terms of, uh, of a fertilizer and put that back on a field in that way. Um, that's an engineering question though, and uh, I'm not sure how far along we are. So people have, you know, thought about trying to capture the oils from these things. Um, but I would just say, you know, here in Iowa, the, the scale of this issue is, I think, beyond most people's comprehension that, you know, that live outside the state. And, you know, we have 71,000 miles of streams and we have, you know, probably 200 uh, lakes and an engineering solution like this in a place like Iowa is just, I mean, it's not going to fly. Yeah, I was looking at that. Uh, the technology doesn't exist yet to make this uh, make this track. Maybe one day. Okay, great. That's an interesting idea. Um, okay, a couple more. Gina says Ohio State University researchers have. Sorry, if you hear snoring, it's my dog. He's right behind me. Um, <laughs> I promise I haven't fallen asleep. Um, Ohio State University researchers have work showing cyanotoxin uptake by food plants. So I think the work is in progress. Um, and Patrick says there is no oil val value per se in cyanobacteria. And then he says Wisconsin. I don't know if that makes any sense. <laughs> well, I asked Patrick what he was, uh, he, I had he ah. answered him about a question he was asking about in terms of it being a hazardous product. But I'd have to look up what in Wisconsin sort of those regulations are. Um, and in terms of the oil value, I mean, I think Chris, you mentioned sort of the, uh, I mean, there definitely is work from some of the energy companies and in, in sort of growing, you know, sort of massive cyanobacterial uh, cultures and then harvesting specific oils out of the fuels. Um, so I know that kind of research is going on. So, you know, I don't know that there's, you know, while there's not oil value per se in cyanobacteria maybe today where that's a, an economically viable thing, I, I certainly think that there's a lot of work going into seeing that that someday is a possible fuel source. I mean, there's no question there's nutrient value in, you know, the, there's nitrogen and phosphorus in the cells. And so getting it back on the field rather than, you know, having it run down the Mississippi River to the Gulf certainly would make some sense, at least in theory, but you know, like I said, it just, that will never be practical here as a solution. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with that, but I'm also, I guess I, I try to be the optimist in terms of um, at some point, if we know a little bit more about how to catalyze some of those uh, reactions to turn more recalcitrant forms of that stuff into, uh, you know, basically more bioavailable form, then it becomes a more viable uh, solution in terms of, of, of uh, recycling that. Uh, into kind of the, the agricultural system again. But again, that, that, that just doesn't exist right now. We don't have an economically viable way to turn those in. You know, we've been working with a group in Germany looking at Fourier transfer ion cyclotron resonance mass spectroscopy. There's a whole suite of organophosphorus compounds that you know, we don't even know about. Um, so our, our understanding of the organophosphorus chemistry associated with this stuff is, is fledgling at best. And so there's a tremendous amount of work to do. So there's students out there who are interested in, in, in topics that, 
there's lots of opportunities, I think, out there in terms of, of, of things to try to understand that can have significant societal impact if you figure it out. For sure, lots of work to be done. Um, this one I think is for Chris and it was dropped in the chat box. It says, what type of continuous nitrate sensors do you use and how long do they last and hold calibration in the field? So we use the Hawk Nitratax SC Plus. Um, they are very, um, you know, robust and accurate, and we we do monitor the the signals from these things pretty closely to see if they appear to be malfunctioning. We visit we visit each site at least two times uh, during the warm weather season. Um, and then they're sent into co into Hawk at the end of the year for a factory recalibration. But by and large, they they are a, quite a um, remarkable device. So, great. Um, I'm just digging through the chat here. Uh, what are concentrations of nitrogen seen in the Iowa rivers? So statewide, we have an average probably between six and seven milligrams per liter uh, at all our monitored sites. And so in headwater streams, uh, you know, we have streams that never get below 10 as nitrogen. Um, you know, in a drought condition, we can see in a real slow moving stream you know, no nitrogen at all because we've, you know, had processing of the nutrient, but just looking at the available data, yeah, about between six and seven. I think we're down to the very last few here. Who has the most effective method to improve farming practices or reduce external loading? Well, <laughs> um, you know, we know, we know things that farmers can do to reduce nutrient loss, uh, but all of these things cost money. And so the question isn't so much as who's got the best solution as to who's going to pay to implement these solutions. And so like a wetland, for example, a, a constructed wetland to capture runoff from say 40 acres or maybe as much as 100 acres costs a half a million dollars or more. And so, you know, who's gonna pay for that? And, you know, we would need thousands of these wetlands in Iowa to reach our, you know, water quality objectives. And so, um, you know, there are things farmers can do, but you know, it's really difficult to get an adoption without a substantial input of money from the public. Okay, and we still have questions rolling in. This is great. Um, what percentage of Iowa crop fields are tile drained? Well, that, that is a good question and there's no record records of that. On the Des Moines lobe, which is the area that was last glaciated, um, basically the, the area north of Des Moines, it's probably about 30% of our total area. Almost all the fields are pattern tiled. Um, east of there and this what we call the Iowan surface, same thing. Um, so we think there's about 2 million miles of tile in Iowa. Um, <laughs> Most of that would be in areas north of Interstate 80, which is, you know, about 60% of our area. Okay, and one more. Are you aware of anyone in the U.S. that has used lanthanum-based bentonite clay to address phosphorus levels? Well, I know there's been uh, certain things uh, experimented with to put around a, a feedlot, for example, a cattle feedlot. Um, I don't know about that material in particular, but some of these livestock engineers have looked at solutions like that. 
All right. Well, I think that wraps up our session. Thank you all for participating and staying a little bit longer. Um, again, uh, we will be sending out an email with a link to the recording of the presentations today, um, as well as a brief survey. Um, and again, feel free to connect with the Algal Bloom Action Team on the North Central Region Water Network website and um, or reach out to me personally um, if you have any questions or additional feedback. Thank you both, Chris and Greg, for your participation. And Thank you, everybody. Thank you. We'll see you again in a couple of months, hopefully. <laughs>